It's a great pleasure to be here and I would like to thank the organisers for the opportunity to come and present some of the work that I've been involved in with the team up in Newcastle. So it's a long way away from here, but um, a lot of it I hope will be very familiar to many of you and a lot of the symptoms that I describe I know will be very familiar to many of you. Um, so what I'm going to do over the next 20 minutes or so is just give you a flavour of the work that we're doing up in Newcastle. It's by no means exhaustive, and there's a whole team of people based up there in a group called the Fatigue Interest Group, which brings together a variety of different disciplines, clinicians, basic science researchers, epidemiologists, to actually look at the symptom of fatigue in chronic disease. And, of course, one of those is CFSME. And a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today, specific to CFSME, have actually come about because of techniques that we've developed in fatigue-associated chronic diseases and lessons that we've learnt from other chronic disease settings. So what I'm interested in is blood pressure. And in the UK, there is a real drive to push blood pressure lower and lower which in my clinical world is great because as you lower people's blood pressure, you make them fall over. And that is what I do on a day-to-day -day basis is actually see older people who've fallen over. And in the UK, there's this tendency to think that you either have high blood pressure or good blood pressure. And we seem to forget that actually low blood pressure has major implications that go along with it because it makes you feel rubbish. So a lot of what I'm going to talk about is about blood pressure and its regulation. And that comes about from the fact that evolutionary, we started off like this, where our heart and our head were in line with each other. And that was fine because our heart could perfuse our brain because it, gravity wasn't against it. But as we've evolved to the upright position, we now have a problem. And our heart is below our head. So we constantly have a battle to try and keep our brain perfused against the forces of gravity. And we do that using something called your autonomic nervous system. And we've heard a lot about autonomic nervous system abnormalities in the previous speakers. And this is the subconscious nervous system that goes on outside our conscious control. So at the moment, your tummy's starting to rumble because you're waiting for your lunch your bladder might be starting to fill because of that coffee that you've had. Your pupils are a bit dilated because you're probably starting to fall asleep. And those are all autonomic nervous system symptoms that are controlled by two separate networks within your body. The first is your parasympathetic nervous system. So when I stand up, 700 mils of blood drops into my legs. And there are little receptors near my heart that sense this drop in my blood pressure and they send a signal to my brain. And then my sympathetic nervous system, the fight and flight component of the autonomic nervous system, makes my heart go a little bit faster to compensate for that drop in blood pressure to keep my brain perfused and my peripheral blood vessels constrict again to push the blood back to where it needs to be, which is my head. So this is where I work. This is the unit up in Newcastle where we look after patients with blackouts and falls. And if ever any of you are in the area, please come and visit because it's much more real if you see some of these tests that I'll describe firsthand. But what we're able to do is use novel technology that allows us to measure blood pressure and heart rate beat to beat. So very different than the techniques that your GP will use in, in primary care, we can actually look for really subtle changes in heart rate and blood pressure that are synchronised together. So where does the background to fatigue and autonomic dysfunction come from? Well, there's a huge literature out there, over 400 papers in the medical literature showing that there is a relationship between autonomic dysfunction and fatigue in a range of chronic diseases, 200 papers in CFSME. But we know in multiple sclerosis, Parkinson's disease, rheumatoid arthritis, and the list goes on and on and on, that heart rate and blood pressure regulation play a significant part in the symptom of fatigue. 
And then if we turn it on its head and look at it the other way around and look at people who have problems with blood pressure regulation, so primary autonomic failure and multi-system atrophy, then in that group of patients, the symptom of fatigue is a really significant problem um, that can be controlled by treatment of the underlying autonomic abnormality. So what about CFSME? Well, we have a large cohort of patients up in the northeast. Over 100 patients through the patient support groups have completed a series of questionnaires for us which subjectively assess symptoms when they stand up. And this is an American tool called the orthostatic grading scale. It takes a few minutes to complete. And when we ask patients with a FACUDA diagnosis of CFSME, do you get symptoms when you stand up? Then 89% of them will report that yes, they do have symptoms on standing up. And over a third of those patients will actually reach a score on the orthostatic grading scale consistent with the diagnostic entity of orthostatic hypotension. And we can look with an even more comprehensive symptom assessment tool called the COMPASS or Composite Autonomic Scale that looks across a whole range of different um, organ systems um, for autonomic symptoms. And when we compare a group of patients with CFSME to an age, sex and BMI matched control group, you can see that the CFSME group scores significantly higher on that tool and therefore have a higher autonomic symptom burden than matched controls. And the more fatigued that these patients are, the higher is their autonomic symptom burden. When we look at a liver disease where fatigue is a well-recognized and established symptom called primary biliary cirrhosis and where it is accepted that autonomic symptoms are a significant problem that leads to fatigue, you can see that the CFSME group score even higher than that autoimmune liver disease group. And that led us to actually hypothesize that there is actually a subgroup of patients within the big blue group that are diagnosed with CFSME who actually have what we have coined a dysautonomia-associated fatiguing syndrome. So there is a subgroup within those who are labelled with the umbrella diagnosis of CFSME who actually have a dysautonomia. So that's subjective autonomic symptoms. What about actual autonomic abnormalities when we test patients? Well, this is over 100 patients, again with CFSME, who've had 24-hour blood pressure recordings. So they wear a machine that takes their blood pressure every quarter of an hour for a full 24 hours. And um, this is their average blood pressure compared to matched controls. And you can see that the CFSME group have a lower blood pressure over 24 hours compared to matched control population. But what I'm really interested in is that response to standing. What happens to your brain when you stand up? And at the clinical end of things, if you stand up and your blood drops into your legs, at the extreme end of things, you won't get blood to your head and you'll black out. At the more middle range of things, you'll be dizzy, something that we call presyncope. And what we hypothesize is at the more subtle end of things, if your blood doesn't get back around your body because the responses aren't quick enough, then you won't perfuse your brain, but you'll also not perfuse your muscle, you'll not perfuse your, muscle, your heart, you'll not perfuse other organs in your body. And that's what we hypothesize leads to the symptom of fatigue. And we can actually look at heart rate and blood pressure responses to standing using an established test. And we've heard about the tilt table before and people think it's an instrument of torture, but actually all it is is a table where people um, mechanically are brought to standing on this platform at 70 degrees. So it's just very boring. And what we can measure is a range of parameters. Simple things like heart rate and blood pressure, 
we can synchronise that heart rate and blood pressure to actually look at subtle changes from beat to beat, something called heart rate variability, and we can look at how your heart rate changes per change in blood pressure, something called baroreflex sensitivity. And if we use specific electrodes um, that actually fit around the neck and around the bottom of the chest, we can also look at cardiovascular parameters because those electrodes will send electricity from the top electrode that is detected by the bottom electrode. And that electricity will follow the path of least resistance, which is blood flow from your heart. And from that, we can then calculate cardiac output, stroke volume, and a range of other non-invasive cardiovascular parameters. And this is what our patients look like when they have all the kit on. Um, so lots of different electrodes and patients will stand for 40 minutes if they're able to while we measure beat to beat 37 different variables. So at the end of a 40 minute tilt test, we end up with over 200,000 different variables um, that we can consider. So... In response to standing, what we would normally expect is that your heart rate increases a little bit and your total peripheral resistance, so your vasoconstrictor capacity, that would increase in order to get the blood back to our head. And our blood pressure drops a little, our heart stroke volume and output per heartbeat reduces, and there are changes in our autonomic nervous system, the balance of the parasympathetic and the sympathetic nervous system in a normal situation. So what have we done today? Well, we've actually now um, at, performed tilt tests in over 100 patients with CFSME who've been coming to our clinical service. And interestingly, nearly a third of those people have got a previous history of loss of consciousness and, in fact, probably should have been coming to see us for assessment of syncope um, out with the fact that they um, had been seen for CFSME. And nearly half of the patients experienced symptoms while they were on the tilt table, symptoms that they recognised but had not attributed those particular symptoms to this entity of presyncope and dizziness that we often see patients clinically for. And importantly, over half of the patients had a drop in their blood pressure on coming to standing, which would be consistent with the internationally recognised diagnostic criteria for orthostatic hypotension. So potentially within this autonomic phenotype, we actually have other different subgroups, all of which are potentially amenable to treatment. In terms of another autonomic phenotype, this is a condition called positional orthostatic tachycardia syndrome, or POTS. And um, this is a patient whose heart rate here, they've come to standing here, and their heart rate has increased dramatically on assuming the upright position. And this is the same patient who's been treated with a medication called evabridine. This girl is a 27-year-old is a patient who'd been diagnosed with ME for 10 years and um, her symptoms have improved dramatically on control of her heart rate. And I'm very interested in a clinical trial of patients with POTS as there isn't one at, currently in the literature. And this is our total subgroup of patients who've had the tilt test and there are a variety of different phenotypes for POTS but the one to look at is the total number of patients. Um, the dark bar is the patients with CFSME, and this is the normal control patients. And 27% of those with a diagnosis of CFSME reached a diagnostic criteria for POTS. When we, and I'm just going to show you one or two slides to summarize the results of the, the tilt test, but as you can imagine, there's an awful lot of data there. But to put it in a nutshell, there are major hemodynamic differences between the CFS and the control populations um, at a variety of different time points through the tilt um, table testing. 
and we're hoping to get a grant we've been asked to put through to the second round for the, uh, the American Foundation um, to actually work with a statistician with all this data that we have to try and develop an autonomic biomarker that would allow us to identify the various different autonomic phenotypes uh, within the patients that we see with CFSME. So this is just, again, looking that the more fatigued patients are, um, the greater their increase in heart rate on standing. So um, why might autonomic problems actually lead to the symptom of fatigue? Well, one of the things that we've been doing is a range of MRI studies in patients who've been coming to see us in conjunction with their autonomic testing. And we've now had 16 patients with CFSME patients with other fatigue-associated chronic diseases and controls who've um, been in our MRI scanner, which is currently the most powerful in the UK, and they've been exercising in the MRI scanner, um, which is something that allows us to look at metabolism in their muscles while they exercise. And um, I'm, in terms of normal things, the volume of the patients with CFS muscle and the um, amount that they're able to exercise um, as a one push at the very beginning is comparable between our normal controls and our CFS group. Um, and this just is a series of very messy slides, but to just emphasize to you the pink blobs on the top graph of the CFSME patients, this is acid within muscle at the start of exercise and at the time of exercise, and this is during recovery. You can see that there is a real difference in ability to recover exercise in our CFS um, population compared to our controls. So they generate a lot of acid in their muscles, which they find it very difficult to get rid of um, after exercise. And these are our normal controls in, in recovery, and this is our CFSME patients who find it very difficult to get rid of acid from within their muscles during what is quite reasonably light exercise. And to put it into perspective with another chronic disease, um, this is primary biliary cirrhosis patients who have fatigue and non-fatigue primary biliary cirrhosis patients. And you can see that the chronic fatigue syndrome patients have comparable problems with removing acid from their muscles compared to another um, fatigue-associated chronic disease. And this has now been accepted uh, into a hepatology journal, but with um, the data from our CFSME um, population in there. So we'll be able to cite that in future references and grant applications. Um, and in terms of the relationship to autonomic dysfunction, when we've actually looked at time to pH recovery, this is our CFSM group and this is our um, normal population. There are correlations between people's autonomic function and taking just heart rate variability as one of those parameters. Um, so your ability to get rid of acid appears to be determined by how you're able to wash the acid away from your muscles after you have exercised. So in terms of other consequences of autonomic dysfunction, um, in, we're also performing brain MRI and cardiac MRI in Newcastle in patients with CFSME in some pilot studies that we're doing. And the reason for this is, is related to this graph. Um, these are patients who drop their blood pressure when they stand up, so they have orthostatic hypotension. And this is a memory score, a very simple cognitive test. And this graph shows that the more people drop their blood pressure when they stand up, so the greater the drop, the worse people will perform on memory tests. And there's an established literature from the dementia world that if you have problems with blood pressure regulation, then you are more likely to have cognitive problems and are more at risk of cognitive decline. And in terms of our PBC population, this is a, a disease-specific um, fatigue score, but again, high scores, more fatigue. And this is just an IQ score. And this just confirms that the more fatigued people with PBC are, and I have no reason to doubt that the CFSME population will be different, but those are experiments we're doing at the moment. But the more fatigued PBC patients are, 
the poorer they will perform on cognitive testing. And the lower their blood pressure is, the poorer their IQ is, so the poorer their memory and concentration is. And we've done MRI scans on the PVC population where some poor medical students have been counting these little lesions here, which are white matter lesions. And when they've counted these lesions to give us an individual lesion load for our patients with PVC, um, again, the lower people's um, autonomic function, so the more autonomic dysfunction they have, um, the um, higher their lesion load is. And this is my final slide, and people always ask me, but what about treatment? What are you going to do about this to make me feel better? And the good news is that there are established treatments for autonomic dysfunction that are eminently applicable to patients with CFSME who have an autonomic phenotype. And certainly in the unit, when I'm seeing patients with postural dizziness and autonomic symptoms who have CFSME, we're now trying established autonomic um, treatments to see whether or not they improve people's symptoms. The Nuffield Foundation have funded a feasibility study for a student to help us with over the summer, where we're actually going to invite patients with CFSME in to perform something called tilt training with us. And that's a very simple, non-invasive, non-pharmacological treatment that is known to improve autonomic dysfunction in patients with syncope. So we're going to take what we know from the syncope, invasive vagal syncope world, the extreme end of blood pressure regulation problems, and see whether or not we can have improvements in autonomic dysfunction and symptomatology in CFSME patients. Um, and hopefully we'll have answers with regard to that after the summer. Um, I'm very glad, considering Joanna's here, that I put my Medical Research Council blob in there. Uh, the Medical Research Council funds the PBC work. Um, we have a grant to look at fatigue pathogenesis in primary biliary cirrhosis. And um, very um, cleverly, ME Research UK and the local clinical network um, saw that as an opportunity for us to bolt into those studies a CFSME um, group. And um, many of the studies that we're doing at the moment are funded by them um, using the same protocols that we've developed with the MRC project. Thank you very much. Are we talking about lactic acid here? Yeah, that's a very good question, and we think it probably is. But we're actually um, doing some molecular work in the PBC patient group and um, developmental work with the MRI scanning to actually see whether we can probe, is it specifically lactic acid or is it another acid that is causing the problem? But it probably is lactic acid, but we don't know that for absolutely sure yet. Just, just very quickly, uh, could constant untreated... Um blood pressure problems cause long-term brain problems, for example, with dementia? Yes. That's there a worry. Is, yeah, there is absolutely a literature from the dementia world that low blood pressure is a major risk factor for cognitive impairment and predicts cognitive decline. In PBC now, we have uh, evidence that autonomic dysfunction at baseline, if we follow patients for two years, whether they have autonomic dysfunction at baseline will predict whether their cognitive tests decline and that's now published in the major hepatology journal. Um, and we are very much wanting to do exactly the same studies in CFSME. Um, some of those have been funded um, by ME Research UK, which hopefully we'll be able to start with after the summer. Thank you, Julia. Um, I definitely had orthostatic hypertension quite severely when I was quite ill, and um, I was put on a medication, nimodipine, which is a calcium channel blocker. Yeah. And my cognitive impro improvement was marked over the next month or two months or so. Mm -hmm. And has, uh, I still take it intermittently, actually, mm -hmm. uh, on a very uh, empirical sort of basis. Um, but is there any, I know this is a sort of, people think it's a sort of a red herring or something, but it, it um, specifically increases the blood flow through the brain, protecting it in subarachnoid hemorrhage mm -hmm. and such. Is there any application for nimodipine, and is it worthwhile investigating in your context? Yeah, I think 
that there is a, a reasonable amount of data in patients with um, orthostatic hypotension and nimodipine. I think what we need to do is actually do the baseline assessments, specifically in CFSME with the memory problems to prove um, and when we've asked patients with CFSME do you have memory problems 100% of them do so I don't for a minute um, imagine that the findings when we replicate what we've done with primary bilirubin cirrhosis will be any different in CFSME but it's only recently we've actually had the funds to do those experiments and those studies once we've actually proved that um, autonomic dysfunction um, blood pressure um, low blood pressure particularly, that that does associate it with proper assessments of cognitive function, then we'll be in a position to actually go on and do longitudinal studies and also intervention studies. So I, I absolutely agree. Um, we can actually look at blood flow in CFSME with MRI scanning and look at the differences um, between um, CFS and normal people in terms of cerebral blood flow and we haven't got those studies funded yet. There's a lot of nutritional supplements available and I'm just wondering might any of these be beneficial and might also a little extra salt in our diet be beneficial? Yeah, <laughs> uh, do you know it's terrible. I was, I, I was once described on a chat, BBC chat line as the Antichrist for suggesting that people should have a packet of crisps a day, mm. and which actually crisps was probably the wrong thing to say because of the fat in them. But um, clinically, we recommend to our patients with orthostatic hypotension to consider how much salt they're taking in their diet, and that uh, salt is an essential mineral and that we need some of it in our diet. And a lot of this drive to withdraw salt entirely from our diet may not be necessarily the best thing. So if there's anything that people who are patients take away today, two and a half litres of fluid a day and a little bit of salt are things that might help. Uh, there, there's some evidence that uh, enteroviruses, uh, when it affects the gastrointestinal tract, can actually tra uh, travel retrograde through the nerves into the spinal cord and the brainstem. And how many of the patients that you have nicely described actually have low-grade fevers, nice sweats, or gastrointestinal complaints? Yeah. Very, very many of them have gastrointestinal complaints. And um, blood pressure um, lowering is very often people, before they black out, will have a prodrome of um, nausea and abdominal pain. So that symptom doesn't surprise me at all with CFSME patients. And certainly the COMPASS questionnaire quantifies all of that. And there is a very strong relationship between GI symptoms and, and how fatigued people are. Now, in terms of night sweats and things, we do have um, the ability in our group to do thermal um, imaging and a variety of other different temperature regulation tests. Because, as you, as you know, the autonomic nervous system regulates your temperature control. And, um, again, we're starting to get some evidence that temperature when we quantify it, um, is abnormal in the CFS patients. But perhaps I'll have to come back next time and present that. Yeah. Uh, biofeedback and neurofeedback are effective ways of dealing with some autonomic nervous symptoms, symptoms like blood flow, blood pressure, temperature fluctuations. Do you think, in your opinion, that that, that kind of... Um, neurofeedback training is a possibility for dealing with some of these very troubling yeah. symptoms? Um, tilt training, which is what we're actually doing, is, um, a, te is an, um, a technique whereby people stand... Um, I'll rewind a moment. If I was to tilt somebody every day um, for three weeks who has vasovagal syncope, um, so normally they would black out during a t that tilt test. If I did that tilt every day, they would go longer each day before they blacked out. Mm. And that is the treatment for vasovagal syncope in um, Europe. And um, what we've done clinically for our patients with vasovagal syncope is adapt that so that they do their own little tilt test each day at home. And... In our trial in vasovagal syncope, we found that not only does that improve people's symptoms, and we think it resets their baroreceptors, their pressure receptors within their body, not only does it improve their syncopal symptoms, but it also improves their autonomic function tests um, when we perform them before and at six, four weeks, six months, etc. And um, So what we're wanting to do is see whether or not the same applies. 
we're not only doing active tilt training, but half the patients will be randomised to sham tilt training. Um, so we'll be able to see whether or not it is actually the positive feedback of um, a, a reassuring, empowering environment, or whether or not it is truly the effect of the tilt training that is making the difference to people's symptoms and their autonomic nervous system. Certainly from vasovagal syncope, it's the active tilt training rather than the um, reinforcing, empowering um, attitude of the research nurse. Well done. Thank you very much indeed. You're terrific. <laughs> <laughs>